Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. In this video, we're going to take a look at a really bizarre little circuit that uses RF to test capacitors in their circuit. There's actually quite a few bizarre things about this little tester. So let's get the thing on the bench and check it out. This is the very interesting little capacitor tester that we're going to take a look at today. This is known as a PACO Model C-25 in-circuit capacitor tester. These things can be had at most ham radio swap meets or online auctions for relatively cheap now. And one of the nicest things about this little capacitor tester is their very easy restoration. There's very few components, if any, that need to be replaced in these things to work. There's no rectifier. There's no filter capacitor. It really is quite a bizarre little circuit inside this thing. And in just a little bit, we'll take a look at the schematic and I'll explain exactly how this thing works. So looking at the face of this thing, this at the top here is an eye tube. And for those of you that aren't familiar with what an eye tube is, in this case, it's a nine pin vacuum tube with a fluorescent target painted on the inside of the bulb. Right about in the center of the vacuum tube at the backside is a cathode that glows orange. That cathode emits electrons and in front of the cathode is a grid and that deflects the electrons to either end of this fluorescent target. So the electrons strike the fluorescent target and cause a blue glow on either end. By varying the voltage on the grid that's in front of that cathode, we can move that deflection in or out. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to be two blue bars that are going to join in the center or they'll go and return to the open areas at the end here. You'll just see two little blue areas here. These particular eye tubes were very common in the older European radio receivers. They use them as tuning indicators or signal strength meters. So a pretty common little tube. This is known as an EM84 or an 6FG6. So 6 Fox Golf 6 is the number of this vacuum tube here. I'll get into how this operates a little bit more here in the future. When we're testing some capacitors in circuit here in just a little bit, you'll see exactly how this eye tube works. So in order to get inside this box is relatively easy. There really is just two screws on the back that need to be removed. So we'll remove these two screws. Now you'll notice an oval area here around the cord. In order to get the case off this, we'll remove the screws. I'll put my hands on the side of the case and I'll press my thumbs in this open area and that'll pop the back case off. So I'll grab my screwdriver here and I'll just remove these two slotted screws. One of the things that needs to be known about removing slotted head screws on a case like this is if you put a lot of downforce on it and you slip, you're gonna put a nice big scratch in the case. So if you're not too worried about originality, replacing these screws with a Phillips head screws, Robertson or something else like that is recommended. Either that or you're gonna have to really guide the screwdriver. Again, any little slip, if you have a really nice looking case on your unit, you're gonna put a nice big scratch in it. Very common. And this is pretty brittle stuff. You can see where underneath the screw, it's already come off just a little bit. So, to get the case off, hands on the side, press in the center, and it just comes off like this. A lot of these older cases have that little oval area here so that you can do that. And as you can see inside the unit, there are very few components, a little power transformer, two vacuum tubes, a coil, a variable capacitor, a VR, and you know some fixed resistors, and not a whole lot of stuff in here. There's not even any paper capacitors in this thing. So basically with this thing, I'm gonna be checking to see if the line cord's okay and it's pretty much ready to plug in. Very simple unit. So what I'll do is I'll reposition the camera here and we'll take a closer look at the circuitry. Here's a closer look at the inside of this capacitor tester. The first two things that we'll take a look at are these two controls right here. So this is a potentiometer and this adjusts the bias 
of this indicator tube, which is an EM84 or 6FG6. Very easily adjustable by sticking a screwdriver in there and rotating this. This is a variable capacitor, and this capacitor is across this coil. So if it's across this coil, what it's going to do is adjust the frequency of the oscillator. Now, depending on the way that they have this hooked into circuit, this might be cold. I'm not sure at this point. We'll have to take a look at the schematic in a little bit. A lot of the times with capacitors like this, when they are correctly installed, if one side attaches to chassis ground, it's the side that this screw is attached to here. Now, you'll notice that this has a metal washer underneath it, and it's rubbing against this side here. So this side should be attached to chassis ground. And if I turn this over, it is. So they've installed this correctly. Now, if you were to install this backwards, what would happen is if you use just a normal metal screwdriver like this, when you touch this screw, it would detune this coil. And that's the reason for plastic tuning tools. Now, in some circuits, both ends are elevated from the chassis ground. It just depends on how the particular circuit is designed. So sometimes there is no way to get around it. You need to use some form of an insulated screwdriver. Now, here's a catch that a lot of people just don't know about. These particular capacitors are hiding in IF transformers in older radios, and you can access these through the top, through some holes in the top of the IF transformer. What a lot of people don't realize is that this is above ground. It's actually at B+. So the screw itself has you know, three to 400 volts on it, and the can that it's in is tied to the chassis. So people poke metal screwdrivers through and then they touch the screw. What it does is it shorts the B plus directly to chassis ground. You get a huge spark. And a lot of the times it wrecks the IF transformer. Sometimes it even wrecks these capacitors. So if you're ever working on an older radio receiver and you look through the top and you see a little screw like this down in a can, do not use a metal screwdriver. If you don't know what side is tied to chassis ground, you don't want to use a metal screwdriver as well because you can cause some damage. And of course, you can damage yourself as well, especially if this is hot, right? So one of the uh, major failure points of IF transformers in older radios, a lot of people think that capacitors kill them. Well, they do, but honestly, the way I've seen them destroyed, I think it's more from people slipping metal screwdrivers through and then shorting them out. So something to keep in mind when you're working on older radio receivers. Sometimes these things can be really tough to move just because they are so stiff from being, you know, sitting for such a long period of time. They're really not meant to be adjusted all that much. Pretty much a set it and forget it kind of deal, right? So using a plastic screwdriver, sometimes you twist the end off of it. There are a couple tricks to get around it. Sometimes I put heat shrink tubing around the entire screwdriver here. So I'll put heat shrink all the way up to the top and there's just a little bit exposed so that if I do poke this through an IF can, this will not touch the sides. It just touches the heat shrink tubing. There's a bunch of tricks and I'll go over all these tricks here in the future. In some future videos, I'll show you all of these little catches that people just don't realize. So on the top side, this is the indicator tube. You can see they've got a little metal it's like a piece of copper going over like this and just holding this. They've got the piece of copper curled around the evacuation point on the vacuum tube. So not a very strong point, but as you can see, it's not tight. It's just to stop the tube from, you know, bending out of the way of the window here. You want that fluorescent target right at the window. So that's in there pretty nice. It looks like it's all original. You know, none of the uh, lettering and numbering is rubbed off there. There's a tube EM84. 6FG6. This is a 6C4, a very common triode used in all sorts of different applications. They make great phase inverters and audio amplifiers. They make great oscillators. Uh, lots more tricks with the 6C4, especially around Hammerlin devices, and I'll get into that in the future. Not all 6C4s are created equal, and uh, you know some of them are very. Some of the receivers are very picky with a 6C4. Uh, another catch with tube testers, you'll plug this thing into a tube tester, it'll test 100%. You'll put it into an oscillator circuit, and it won't oscillate. You'll test another 6C4 out of a box, put it in your tube tester, tests 100%, put it into the circuit, oscillates just fine.
So I'll go over why that happens as well in the future. Here we have a dual potentiometer, which is used for this control right here. So we can use this to determine whether a capacitor is good. So, a little bit squeaky. So I'm gonna spray contact cleaner in a lot of these just before I go about doing any kind of alignment. I'll also clean this up here a little bit as well. This is the selector switch down at the bottom here. You can see that moving into all the different positions. A bunch of resistors that should be checked. So these resistors are only three bands, so that means that they're 20% tolerant. So they'll be within 20% of what they say on here. And uh, that's pretty common with only three band resistors. So no fourth band equals 20%. There's a 56 ohm resistor there, 22K ohm resistor there. There's another. This is a two watt. These are all Allen Bradley. So this is an Allen Bradley style resistor when they're squared off on the ends like that. When you find a roundy type resistor, I don't know if this has any of them in it. No, not really. Pretty much all Allen Bradley style. When you find the roundy style resistors, those are the ones that drift in value quite a bit. These are pretty good. They usually hold their value. This is 10% of so silver bands, so 22 ohms here. And on the back side, they got a mixture of newer carbon film resistors and carbon composition resistors here. So I'll go through all of these and test these to make sure that they're pretty good. Like this is a you know 2.2 meg resistor right here. And a lot of the times these resistors, they do move in value a little bit. So you, you, you don't want to verify those. These are going to be very stable. Not a big deal with these. And this here, this capacitor is a, a poly style capacitor. So no paper caps in this. So honestly, there's really nothing to replace in this. It's pretty much ready to go. Check the line cord, you know, that's, you can pretty much try the thing right out. Here's the very interesting schematic on this capacitor tester. Now there are quite a few points of interest on this schematic here and I could really spend a lot of time just tearing this thing right down to every capacitor, inductor, resistor and so on. But that would really make the explanation of the schematic an entire video within itself. Now I know some of you would really enjoy that and of course a lot of you would probably say, you know, let's just move on. So you can leave your comments down below and let me know what you think of you know, basically entirely explained schematics in the future. I might actually do that or put a separate timeline in the video so that you can skip the entire explanation if you're into that. Again, this would be really quite a long explanation to just really dive into every little component here, even for such a small little schematic. So. I'll start with the power supply here, which is very interesting within itself. You can see we have a nicely illustrated plug here. This plugs into the wall. We have a power switch. This is our main power transformer here. It has a step up action and a step down action. You'll notice that they've illustrated this particular portion of the power transformer separately. I don't know why they've done that. Usually they just draw the, you know, the core connected here, but that's just the way that they've drawn it in this case. So this isn't an inductor or anything like that. This is all part of the same transformer. They've just kind of separated it and put a ground in the center here. So you can see we have 117 volt primary, which plugs into the wall. Now the standard is 120 volts AC, not a big deal. You can plug this thing directly in the wall. Nothing's going to happen. I notice a lot of people get really picky about that. They think they need to go out and spend a hundred dollars on a Variac or uh, you know a buck transformer. Not a big deal. You can plug this in the wall. When you get down to about 115 volts, down to 110 volts AC, then you need to start thinking about buck transformers or Variacs. 117 is close enough, not too big of a deal. So the transformer is going to take 117 AC and step it up to 330 AC. So you can see that we have a step up actioning happening in T1 here, which creates quite a shock hazard on the secondary side of this transformer here. So if you're unfamiliar with vacuum tube technology and the voltages present inside stuff like this, you really need to do some research before you go poking around or you can get quite a zap off of something like this. You don't want to hurt yourself. So do the research first before you go working on something like this if you're unfamiliar with this. If you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. So you can see we have one end just tied to the chassis here and we have 330 volts AC present on this line. There's no rectifier, there's no filter capacitor. Really odd little circuit. But again, less components equals more dependability. So what they're doing is they're just using the tube itself as self-rectifying. So tubes will only conduct one way. We have electrons flying from the cathode here, which is this little C symbol above the heater here. The electrons fly from there 
to the plate of the vacuum tube. So what's going to happen is the circuit is only going to conduct or operate on one portion of the cycle. It's not going to work on this portion of the cycle at all. So basically what's going to happen is it's only going to work on this portion of the cycle here, ignoring what's underneath the line if you're to look at an oscilloscope self-rectifying circuit. We just saved a whole bunch of components. Very neat idea, very dependable. Again, you look at this thing, there's really nothing to do with this. There's nothing really even to restore in this little capacitor tester. The only thing that would you would be looking for is maybe resistors that have moved in tolerance, checking the tubes to see if they're okay. Other than that, clean the switches and away you go. Very simple restoration. You can see they're doing the same thing with the 6C4 oscillator tube as well. You can see that it's just basically operating on one half of the cycle. Very interesting little circuit. So this is the eye tube here and you can see that we have R10. That's that potentiometer that I pointed out that's mounted to the chassis when we're going to drop a screwdriver in and turn. So this adjusts basically the bias of this vacuum tube here. So we're going to be setting up the bias on the tube to a specific point, uh, an operating point that they claim within their alignment procedure. And we'll go over that as we're setting this whole thing up. It really is quite a simple alignment procedure. Again, this is just biasing the tube up is all it's doing. Over here, we have the 6C4 oscillator tube and that adjustable capacitor is directly across L1. That was that long looking coil on the top there. Now, this is going to move from 3 to 30 picofarad. Now, in the old days, they wrote picofarad as micro microfarad. And it's the same thing that you see with gigahertz nowadays. If you look at things up in the gigahertz, back in the old days, it was listed as kilo megahertz. So, you know, 40 kilo megahertz is 40 gigahertz, right? It's just the way that they draw things, you know, kilocycles, megacycles, kilohertz, megahertz, same thing, right? It's just old speak for the way that they used to do things. So you can see that we have quite a bit of uh, variation here between one end to the other. We can go down to three picofarad or all the way up to 30 picofarad. Now that's going to allow us to move this oscillator around quite a bit. So we're going to be able to tune this quite easily here. And I'll get into this in just a moment. Now you can see here that we have a tune. This tune is that big VR on the back side. There's actually, it's two VRs on the back side and they're ganged together. That's what this dotted line shows here. So one shaft, when you turn one shaft, it's tuning two VRs, two variable resistors. One of those variable resistors is 5k ohms. The other one is 250 ohms. And again, one shaft turns both of those at the same time. This is that big 22 ohm resistor in the middle, that two watt Allen Bradley one that I mentioned. This is going to allow us to determine how many microfarad a capacitor is. So that again is determined by rotating that knob and it's just a coarse uh, I guess you could call verification of a capacitor. This isn't going to exactly point, if say you have a five microfarad capacitor, it could be on either side of the five. Basically what you're doing is you're looking for the action of the eye tube and you're going to use that action to determine whether a capacitor is good or not. And we'll look at that here in just a little bit. That's what this circuit is here for. And you can see that they're using the 6.3 volt winding of this transformer to not only light the tubes, but they're using that AC to supply the rest of the circuit to operate the circuit as well. Very interesting. Again, very minimalistic here. No rectifiers or anything like that. Now, for testing capacitors in circuit, this is where the magic of this little oscillator circuit comes in. We have a 40 inch piece of coax. It's a 93 ohm, which is an interesting, you know, uh, resistance or impedance, I should say, for a piece of coax here. So we have a 93 ohm line here running from the unit out to those two alligator clips. Now, you remember I said that the, the lines are too long. I still have to correct that. This is going to act as a one quarter wavelength stub. So now this is what's going to happen within this stub. I'm not going to get directly into exactly what's going on with that stub. Again, we're dealing with an entire video worth of explanation in RF here. So when we have a one quarter wavelength stub and we short the ends. So if we took those two alligator clips and we short them 
At this end to this oscillator coil, it looks like it's open. When we open the alligator clips at the other end of that one quarter wavelength stub, so that's a one quarter wavelength away, it looks like this is shorted. So it's actually giving us the opposite action at this end. So what's going to happen if we short one turn of this transformer, that big coil that you see? The same thing happens when you short a transformer like this on this line. Well, what happens? The thing is going to fight. It's not going to work. Well, this oscillator here is oscillating with such light resistance values that what's going to happen is just shorting that one turn is going to stop this oscillator from oscillating. That's going to cause our eye tube to work. This is going to cause our deflection. So what's going to happen is when we close those clips on the other end, indicating a good capacitor, right? Because if we put a capacitor between those two clips, it's going to look like a short at the other end. If it's shorted at this end, this end looks like it's open and the oscillator will start up again. Very interesting little circuit. Now I'm going to get into quarter wavelength stubs and quarter wavelength matching transformers and all of that stuff with RF here in the future. Again, getting into explaining what's going on within this quarter wavelength stub and why this is stopping and going. A huge video. And you can leave your comments down below if you really want me to get deep into this kind of RF stuff. Let me know and I'll get right into that. You know, we'll cover reactance, inductance, capacitance, and all of this kind of stuff that we're dealing with in a circuit like this. So at any rate, that is the gist of the circuit and that's really how this thing is working here. Let's experience what's underneath this heat shrink together. It's always interesting to see what other people have done. Some pretty loose heat shrink. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's worthy of looking at. Look at that. There's little fibers going right up into the top here and everything. And this is the kind of stuff that you run across all the time when you're working on this type of gear. You never know what's hiding. That is ugly. So that needs to get fixed up. I've cleaned up this connection here. Well, actually, I completely removed the old connection and started over. And there's a bit of a process in order to making a very dependable test clip like this whether it's on a capacitor tester or whether you're using something like this on an old vacuum tube voltmeter and sometimes even on an older oscilloscope you want some test leads at the end of a piece of wire. And in order to make a dependable connection there is a bit of a process and I'll explain that. So the first thing, I replaced these alligator clips here and I've replaced the wire with a very flexible silicon wire with a high strand count copper wire in the middle. So the high strand count means that it's going to be very flexible. In fact, it's such a high strand count that when you twist the stuff together, it wants to unwind. Now, on the old test cables here that the previous person had used, they've used a solid core wire, and that really isn't preferred. As you can see, it just stays in position. What happens when you use a solid core wire is after a little bit of bending, they break. So this stuff definitely has to go. So very high strand count test lead. This is a, a silicon wire, so you could even lean your soldering iron on this and it won't burn through this very, very flexible stuff. So I put some of this wire into the alligator clips and I soldered it here and then I slid some heat shrink tubing over these. Now this is loose here and I'll explain this in just a moment. So that got that done. So I had two pieces of test lead wire down to here and then what I do is I clip this into a screwdriver so that I hold both test leads at the same length. As you can see, when you hold this like this, they're pretty much exactly the same length. And then when they're held at the same length, then you can work with the coax here and then trim this to the exact right size. Now this coax here, this 93 ohm coax, is very touchy to work with because 
the insulator on the center conductor is very, very sensitive to heat. So if you heat it too much, what ends up happening is it melts and then the center conductor will touch the actual braid. So in order to stop that from happening when you're making your solder connection here is you want to use a piece of high heat shielding here. So this stands a lot of heat. So this is the kind of stuff that you find in toasters. So it'll deal with a lot of heat. So what happens is, is I've cut this flush, just got rid of that old connection completely. So then what I did is I stripped back the insulator on the center conductor just a little bit. So there's a little bit of the center conductor poking out right about to here. Then what I did is I cut the braid back down here so that the insulator runs up to here, runs right up to here. And then there's a little bit of that center conductor poking out. Once that's done, I take the center conductor and the shield and the braid is around it right so you have your shield here and then the braid is around it what you do is you grab the center conductor and you move it around like this and it does this with the shielding so the shielding kind of flares out then what i did is i took a piece of this high heat shielding here this tubing and then i measured it up and cut it here and then i slip it over that very soft insulator so that'll allow me to have more dwell time with my soldering iron right here without melting that very, very soft plastic center, the insulator for the center conductor. Those of you that are familiar with mini foam coax will know exactly what I'm talking about. This stuff is really soft. Now this coax is really a bizarre stuff. If you look at the center conductor in the insulator here, so basically there's this insulator coming up and then there's the center conductor inside. It's actually loose in there. You can move it around like this. There's a lot of space in there. So what I did is I pushed the center conductor off to the side here. All right, so it's pushed off to the side. This piece of silicon wire is stripped a little bit. So this is going to now be tucked into the insulator on here. So the, the insulator for the center conductor. So we have the this sticking out of here like so, and it's a solid wire. And then this is going to run in this way. So basically, if you were to look at it, say this is the, the center conductor here of this wire, it's going to run in the insulator like this, and then this is poking out like this. Now, the nice thing about this center conductor is that it's so incredibly sharp, and it's a fine wire, it'll poke right into this silicon rubber wiring. So I can basically get a straight on connection and that really makes a rugged connection. I don't have a ball sitting on the top here that's going to flex. I have a little bit of this running right down into the center conductor here. And then this is running right up into here. And with a little bit of a gap that's in here, I put a bit of RA flux in there and I touch it with my soldering iron and let the solder flow each way. And I get an extremely tough connection. This will not break. After that's done, I'm gonna slip this down over this like this just for a little bit of added I guess you could say insulation at that point there then I have two pieces of pre-cut heat shrink right here the heat shrink will be pushed over top of this like so just like that I'll shrink this down right here probably back just a little bit I'll shrink this down right here once this is shrunk down, this is still going to be soft because it's not really all that thick. I have one extra piece that will fit right over top of this once it's shrunk down. And that'll make a really, really rugged little area right here so this will not pull apart or anything like that. This will get really solid. And then I've got this much wire to move around. And as you can see, that's plenty to get onto each, you know, across any type of capacitor that you want to test. So it's not too long, it's not too short, it's just about the right size. And this connection will last an extremely long time. Very, very rugged connection, and there won't be any breaking, even with a solid center conductor here. And that would be the way that you would want to try and put this together, or something like that. So what I'm going to have to do now is just heat shrink this down onto here, and then I'll move these two pieces back up. And at that point, we're pretty much ready to try this thing out and do the alignment. Here's a look at the cables with the heat shrink on. So the first piece of heat shrink is shorter than the upper piece of heat shrink. So the first piece is right here on the underside. And then the upper piece of heat shrink is just a little bit longer. And then it's slipped over top. And it goes just a little further up here and just a little further over here. So that's nice and rigid there. 
and everything is ready to go. You can see that I've put just a little bit of heat shrink on this one here, just indicating that this is the braid side. That's all. Nice rigid connection and ready to go. I'm ready to perform the calibration procedure on this little capacitor tester now, and it should go pretty quick. There really only is two adjustments here. There's a potentiometer here and a variable capacitor here. After I'm done with the calibration procedure, I'll show you how the quarter wavelength stub works. So if you're new to quarter wavelength stubs or RF circuitry in general, you'll find this very interesting. This is a whole lot different than working with DC circuitry. You'll see what I mean here in just a little bit. The line cord to the capacitor tester is attached to a current limited isolation transformer. So everything is pretty much ready to go at this point. And I'm ready to start at the calibration procedure number one. You'll notice that there's some brackets on the side here. That's to put little check marks in as you go through the steps so that you remember what step you left off at if you leave this for a while. That's the only reason that these are here through the entire manual. So number one here, it says connect the in-circuit capacitor tester line cord to 117 volt 60 cycle AC line. Already done. It says caution, serious damage will result if the instrument is connected to any other type of power line. So what they're doing is they're telling you not to put 220 into this thing. So it needs to be right around 117 volts. So 120 is fine as well. Now I like the way that they word these old manuals. It says throw the on off switch into the on position. So that's what I'll do. I'll just throw that into the on position. And you can see the little cathode lighting up inside the tube there. It says the tube should light up and after a brief warm up, the eye columns will glow with green fluorescence. Well, it's actually more of a blue color. And you'll notice another little thing that may happen here. I hope it'll display it. So since this has an AC power supply, it'll look like this is fading out just like it's doing right now and coming back on again. And that's because this display is pulsing. So you gotta remember there is no DC supply here, right? There's no rectifier or anything like that. It's just running off a 60 cycle AC. And what's happening is this is falling out of time with the frame rate in the camera. So there is no sync between these two devices. So sometimes you'll see the display, you know, kind of fade out and then come back in and then fade out and come back in. Again, it's just because there is no sync. So if you see the tube fading out, it's not fading out on this end. It just looks like that in the camera. So it says here, put the selector switch in the two to 40 microfarad electrolytics position and short the mini gator clips. So these are the clips here and I just have this tool holding them apart. So short the clips here, just like so. And I'll move this to the two to 40 microfarad position, just like that. Next, it says adjust the 40K calibrating potentiometer, which is this right here. It says R10, which is the EM84 tube bias control on the coil mounting strip so that the eye columns are open approximately one quarter inch. So, Turn the light off here, it might make this a little easier to view. So I'm just going to insert the screwdriver into this potentiometer here and open these till they're about a quarter inch open. It's right about there, like that. So it doesn't need to be incredibly exact, just open them a little bit basically is what they're telling you to do. It says, set the selector switch to the open test position and separate the mini gator clips. So I'll separate the clips here, like so. And I'll set this to the open test position. With an insulated screwdriver, insulated, adjust the trimmer capacitor for a maximum closure of the eye columns. So what they're telling you to do here is just bring them as close to being closed as possible. They don't need to close, just bring them to a point to where they're close to being closed. And you'll see that here in just a moment. So I'll insert this into the trimmer capacitor now. So if you pass it, just back up and get them as close to being closed as possible. So you can see that's the closest position. So if I back this off, see how they open a bit? 
and then I passed it so I need to back the screwdriver up and then just go back and forth until it's pretty much at its maximum closed position and that would be right there. Now it says underneath your caution, do not tighten the trimmer screwdriver control to its completely clockwise position. So what they're telling you is don't tighten this up because you could damage that little trimmer capacitor there. So basically right now this is about halfway through its throw so it's a long ways from being tightened up. So just don't cinch that tight is pretty much all they're saying. Now it says here, readjust the 40K calibrating potentiometer R10 for a little more than maximum closure of the columns. This will result in a thin, bright vertical line in the center of the indicator tube. The correct thickness can be compared to the line under the words all capacitors and electrolytics only. So what they're telling you is, this is the line that they're comparing it to right here. So to simplify this is what they're doing is they're telling you to bring those two bars closed and then overlap them a little bit. So that overlap should be the thickness of that bar right there. So that's all that that means. So we're going to bring them closed and then cause them to overlap a little bit. So I'll turn the light on here. So maybe that'll be a little bit easier to see because that gets a little brighter in the overlap there. So I need to adjust this right now until they close like this and then overlap them just a little bit. So you might be able to see, you can see that overlap. If I get this just right. You can see that little bright line in the center there is about the thickness of this line right here is what they're telling you. And that's what that overlap is. Now it says here, with the mitigator clips shorted, check that the eye is completely closed for each position of the selector switch except the open test position. If necessary, readjust the 40k potentiometer R10, which is this one right here, slightly as in step 7 with the mitigator clips shorted. So, in order to test this, we need to short these clips again, like this. And it should be closed in every position except this one. So it should be closed here. It's closed. Open. So now it should be closed and closed. Closed and closed. It's aligned. Let's take a look at the way this quarter wavelength stub works. So this green wire that you see running off the coil here, that's soldered to that second turn there, is running down to the bottom here, and it just goes right into the center conductor of this coax and runs right up over there. Now, if we take a look at the oscilloscope screen, what I'm going to do is take these clips here, and I'm going to short them out. Now you'll notice that the oscillator has started because when this is shorted out over here, it doesn't look like a short to the oscillator. When this is open, this looks like a short to the oscillator. And to give you a better idea, what I'll do is I'll just take this screwdriver here and I'm going to short this winding. So this outermost winding here just runs to ground. And this is where that green wire is soldered. So what I'll do is I'll just stick the screwdriver in here and I'll just short this out. And look what happens. So I've shorted the winding right there, or I should say I've shorted the coil right at the coil. When I remove the screwdriver, it starts up again. Yet, it's shorted one quarter wavelength away. Now, when I remove the short here to the oscillator here it looks like a short because you can see that there is no signal now to give you a better example of how that looks like a short this coax is just open here what I'll do is I'll desolder this green wire from the coax so that coil is open so it's not connected to this coax and you'll see 
the oscillator start up again. Takes a bit of time to heat this up. It's a pretty big connection here. And now you see it's starting up again. The green wire is disconnected. So you can see how this quarter wavelength stub is working. It's kind of almost reversing the action to this oscillator here. So again, the connection is open up here at the top. I'll connect this green wire back up and you can see it stop the oscillator there. So now what I'll do is I'll just let go of this green wire here. I'll take these alligator clips, short them out again. What's going to happen now? Nothing happens. Looks like an open connection. Ah, the magic of RF. Quite a bit different than DC. Again, I'll open this up. See if I can do this with one hand. Open it up and the signal disappears. So, if you're looking at, at this through DC eyes, comparing this to AC, an open connection is a short. The shorted connection is an open. And that's how a quarter wavelength stub works. You see they're touching again. And if I remove this, no difference. And again, if I touch this to the chassis, You'll notice that this doesn't even stop it. So this green wire is far enough away from that oscillator coil that it won't even stop the oscillator as well. Yet, if I leave this open and I go right to where the green wire attaches to the coil, up at the top here, and I make a short right at the coil, the oscillator stops again. So what they're doing is they're using this quarter wavelength stub to verify the capacitors. So when a capacitor is attached on the end here, this green wire is disconnected down here, so it's not going to show on the oscilloscope. I can actually just reattach that. Just loosely reattach that for now. So. If a capacitor is good, we know that capacitors pass AC. So if a capacitor passes AC, we have a 40 megahertz signal on here, very close to, it's about 38. It's going to look like a short, which is going to indicate a good capacitor. That, in turn, opens the eye. If a capacitor is bad, it's not going to look like a short. The oscillator is going to stop. The eye will close, indicating that we have a bad capacitor. And that's how this little tester works using RF. Now the magic of having this work like this with a 40 megahertz signal is that this RF will ignore other components in the circuitry. Now, of course, we're going to be dealing with shunt resistance, and there is a chart within the actual manual that gives you examples of shunt resistance. So there are some cases where the RF will actually see other portions of the circuit, and it'll give this a false reading. But it really isn't all that incredibly common. So now what we're going to do is test some capacitors in circuit and see how this works. Let's test for some faulty capacitors in this audio amplifier. So the first capacitor that we'll take a look at is this 0.22 microfarad bumblebee capacitor. So I'm in the short test position here and it tests OK. And this is the open test and it tests OK. Now here's the thing, this is a go, no go type of tester. The failure point of this capacitor is in between those states. This thing is turning into a resistor, and this is definitely leaky. This is 100% faulty. And as you can see, this particular capacitor tester is not seeing that. 
So again, this type of a capacitor tester is for extreme testing. It's one extreme or the other, open or closed. So I'll try another capacitor here. This is another bumblebee right here. And short test is okay and open test is okay. So you can see that it's ignoring the rest of the circuitry. So this is working quite well, but again, it's not verifying any kind of leakage. Now that's not a big deal because this isn't designed to look for that. So I'll take a look at this electrolytic capacitor down here. So this is my common end and I'll put this end over here. So it tests fine on the open test and on the closed test or the short test, it's closing but not completely closed. So there may be some form of leakage or some shunt resistance somewhere in here. So let's test it as an electrolytic and see what happens here. So uh, I can get just enough light on this to so you can see this. So we need to tune this for minimum opening so you can see that it's opening there, so we want it at its minimum opening. And that would be right here. So it's between the 16 and the 32 mark here, and this is a 20 microfarad capacitor, so there's a good chance that it's okay. Again, in order to verify this, you would really need to open one end on that capacitor. So let's try another capacitor here. Let's see what else. This one right here, another little bumblebee capacitor. Test for opens, looks okay. Test for shorts, it's okay. So you get an idea of how this is working. It's working great in circuit, it's ignoring everything else around it. So it's doing what it says it's supposed to do. So if you have a case where you need a, a go, no go tester for any kind of capacitor testing in circuit, this is definitely the, the item to use. If you're looking for leakage in a more in depth test of the particular capacitors in here, leakage tests will require you to open one end of the capacitor. So if you're looking for that, you're going to be looking at a different type of capacitor tester. So all in all, it's working very well and it's doing what it's supposed to do. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Hope you enjoyed this episode involving this interesting little capacitor tester. If you did enjoy this, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be more episodes like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at solid state and vacuum tube electronics alike. So if you're into this sort of thing, you might want to hit that subscribe button as well. I have an ongoing electronics course on Patreon right now. So if you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level, you may want to check that out. I'll have the link right below this video in the description right about here. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. When you're there, check out the community section. There's many people sharing their electronics projects there. All right, see you next time. Take care. Bye for now.